Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Facility Management Year in Review, Lessons and Predictions from Industry Leaders. I'm Jennifer Getz, the Editorial Director of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by ARC Facilities. ARC Facilities is transforming access to facilities information with a mobile-first platform for on-the-go facilities teams. Access and share critical building information, including as-builts, closeouts, emergency information, O&Ms, and compliance information via an easy-to-use mobile app. With instant access to building information, facilities teams can cover more ground and be more more responsive and more efficient. Now, before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions via the question box at any time. There will be a Q&A portion after this presentation, so please type your questions in there to send them to us. If at any time you experience a technical difficulty, please send us a message um, via that question section and someone on our team will answer you privately. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure the panel is expanded so you can access the question box. And if you are interested in continuing education credits, please note that you receive a certificate of attendance and an email from facility executive after this webinar. You can report to your association for the credit. Now I'll introduce your speakers for today's discussion. Discussion. Uh, David Trask, uh, National Director of ARC Facilities. Louis Morihon, Executive Managing Director of Newmark. Deborah Chapkowski, Associate VP Facilities Design and Construction for Broward College. Dan Oldhouse, Director of Maintenance at Miami University. And Bert Gummeringer, Senior VP of Facilities Operations at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, thank you all for being here with us today. David, take it away. Hey, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us and a special thank you to our panelists. What we're really going to talk to about today is what's really happened over the past year. So what, what are some of the things that have changed in your sites and also that digital revolution and what we're seeing as far as how it's changed within the different facilities for the folks that are that are on our panel today how COVID impacted that, and then also how they're seeing that the industry is changing overall and how that's impacting their teams. So let's go ahead and jump in. So let's start with what was your biggest change in 2022 versus the previous few years? So Bert, tell us a little bit about how this is impacted and what some of the things that are changed at Texas Children's. All right, thank you, David. One of the biggest things for us was just coming out of COVID and trying to jump back into some regular rhythm about operating the facilities. And what we learned is some people that work remote during COVID never came back to the institution. They stayed remote and we've restructured jobs for people that can work remote, don't need to be in the hospital. And so most of our supply chain people work remote. Um, the other thing that's done for the organization, obviously, it's reduced the amount of real estate we need to hold because we don't need to have as many people here. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, um, some other things happened. We had a large workforce here that was screening people as they came into the institution. Um, now that we've stood COVID down, um, we have had to repurpose those people and transfer them to other jobs. So significant uh, change related to COVID for our organization. Certainly, certainly. And, and Lewis, how has this impacted your sites? Well, in my site, uh, in 2022, what I have seen, I mean, and Bert just mentioned, uh, flexibility is being key for our profession because the, the, what, what we, before COVID was occupancy, that, that metric has crashed for all mm. of us in every single um, category that you can imagine. So we've been working I mean, relentless uh, directly and through our partners and how to make our services flexible to the level of uh, requirement that our clients require, you know, and, 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 and uh, basically it will, uh, for our professional pro professionals and FM professional would require also a new skill to be able yeah. to understand uh, mm -hmm. what's the level uh, of every single service that we provide and be, um, if, if you like, uh, entrepreneurial in, in, in finding solution to that new variable that it appears uh, in, in, in 2022 when we came back from COVID. No, that's, that's wonderful. It sounds like the, the word nimble comes to mind. 
And and that's that's a that's a big deal, I think, especially today. So, Dan, how has that impacted your facilities at the school? Well, our biggest issue was the changing requirements in COVID. Um, this last year, we came out of COVID requirements, um, turned around right before the school year started. Um, they put the implement implemented some other stringent controls back in for the students when they came here. So we had to jump through hoops at the last minute before the school year started to make sure all, all the buildings were posted, all the building systems were adjusted correctly, you know, the MERV 13 filters, things like that. So mm. it had a big impact on that. And then we also had some stringent controls on how our employees interacted with different areas, dining facilities, with um, student rooms, things like that with the students here. So trying to make sure everybody's trained and then prepared for all the different changes. And we did flop back and forth a couple of times because, you know, we have kids from all over the country here. Our levels were up and down, um, maintaining some of our facilities specifically for quarantining, um, having to move students around and feed them. So there was a lot of different challenges that we had at, at this particular year coming from being full blown COVID to, to not and then back and then coming back out of it again. Sure, sure. Well, and continuing that theme with education, Deborah, what are you what are you seeing at your facilities? What are some of those changes? I think uh, along the same thoughts as everybody else was the opportunity to work remote to have the flexibility has been a big change. I know many believe we should go back to working at the office and having person meetings. And I agree for those who are recently joining the workforce, that's a benefit, you know, to have the uh, networking and everything. But at the college, we see it as an added benefit for employee retention. And in my personal experience as a manager, I can say my, me my meetings are much more productive in mm -hmm. Zoom, to be honest. <laughs> there are less side conversations. We're able to get more done. There's also the added benefit of extra time working rather than fighting traffic, like here in Fort Lauderdale and Miami, all the metropolitan areas, the, the traffic is terrible. And sure. I also believe the hybrid work opportunity is going to continue to improve the work-life balance for everybody. Oh, I think that's a, that's wonderful. And, and I and I agree. I think with the flexibility, I, I see this at, at different organizations that I speak with around the country. And and flexibility and and just making that as even an option for some employees goes a long ways you know but obviously in facilities it, it can be tough because you know facilities never left so i think that was that was one of the big things that's underlying is in you know with 2022 facilities wasn't able to always work remote so offering that flexible schedule was another option and and i think that's that's wonderful so what were some of the biggest unexpected incidences that have happened? And let's start with Deborah. <laughs> so to me, the biggest unexpected incident by far is the supply change issues that we're experiencing. Yeah. Um, it has created many delays in our projects, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, in Florida, we have received for the first time in many years, deferred maintenance funds, as well as the funding from HERF, uh, HERF. Uh, which is allowing us to do many more projects, but unfortunately at a higher cost and much longer schedules. Got you. Okay. Okay. And and Dan, are you seeing something similar or what are you running into? No, I think that that was the biggest thing we have right now. There's some, um, we have a lot of building automation system on campus. So trying to mm -hmm. find the computer components, um, ice machines, compressors, air handlers, um, the larger equipment, has been extremely difficult. Um, we've mm -hmm. ordered out, and, and actually, we we have a warehouse here that I manage. And we've actually bought equipment that we keep in the warehouse now that we normally wouldn't because we could normally get it within a couple of days. Um, some of this stuff is 12 to 30 weeks out now, so you really yeah. have to plan ahead and look at what's out there, and then try and find suppliers that that can provide it as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was at a conference, uh, this is earlier this, or earlier last month, I should say, and I was talking to some of the vendors in their, their booths, and, you know, I, I'd heard that chillers are, are three years out in some cases. I've heard uh, generators are, are 18 months. So I've, I've heard that directly from the manufacturers, too. Oh, 
So let's jump over to Lewis. Or what are you running into at your sites? Well, I, obviously that is the biggest issue after uh, for 2022. But I would shift shift to uh, safety. Okay, so mm. coming back to offices and especially our professionals, building were closed for many for many. I mean months, uh, mm -hmm. some of them year, and and we needed to double down in training for safety. I know we have. Uh, a lot of attendees probably are FAMs and they are uh, probably doing very, uh, in some cases, hazardous or, or dangerous activities. So we found that because most of us have been working from home, coming back to a kind of normal, um, uh, we needed to retrain people on, on some kind of safety uh, procedures and MOPs and things like that. We needed yeah. to uh, ad address complacency a lot because um the people were not i mean not not that you know when i'm not used to i mean believe it or not the impact of those uh, 15 uh, 16 months uh, working differently i would not say because obviously fm professional where most most of us were at the buildings yes but right. or still it required a retrain on safety uh, mm -hmm. during 22 and we will double down in 2023 because i think uh, that would keep being a priority, and and obviously also health, health training gotcha. and safety training. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I can definitely see that. I mean, that would be because, like you said, it's there's a dis bit of disconnect disconnect for for 18 months, and you know, coming back into that, it's it's that refresher as well. I'm sure. Uh, Bert, how about you? What are your some of the things that you've uh, you've uncovered? Well, very similar to, to the others, uh, supply chain issues across the board, uh, delays in getting roofing materials and air handlers. And we even had difficulty in uh, getting ambulance chassis. And, wow. uh, and they were, were 12 months out and 424, depending on who you uh, worked with. And so we went directly to Stellantis and bought four slots on the production line to have chassis made specifically for us wow. um, in order to get around um, that uh, long lead time. And um, so supply chain, clearly uh, number one issue, I think, for all of us on the call, getting materials so, so we can keep our facilities operating. Absolutely. Yeah, I can definitely definitely see the theme here and and a lot of commonalities across the different different industry types, different orgs. Um, so what is the biggest shift in your staff this year? So what are some of the things that you ran into? Let's start with Dan. What are some of the things that you ran into as far as your staffing? Well, we're in higher ed and, and in this area, we're a small town. So I had a lot of long-term employees. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a, a lot of retirements over the last year to two years. Um, the, the challenge was is to, to get that institutional knowledge to the the younger people, the newer people. Yeah. Um, we're still struggling a bit on um, workforce, trying to get new hires. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's improved. I think I think our applications are up like 18% from what they were last year, but still oh. have new positions. There's yeah. a lot of competition out there from other companies that um, since we're a small town, trying to pull them from the bigger cities to here is a little bit hard to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and and that's I I've heard this in the, in the different orgs that I've spoke with as well, and and you're all fighting for the small limited pool, and and that's a challenge. I mean, especially especially when you are in the smaller smaller cities. So, Deborah, what are some of the things that you're running into with your staff? Similar, we had retirements, some leaving for higher paying jobs, and others moving actually to be close to family. It was unprecedented year in personal shifts. It has been difficult replacing personnel. And to add to that, all the additional workload that we have has been very difficult for us. Um, so we are thinking outside the box. <laughs> and I have recently reached out to some of our continuing services providers, like our mechanical engineers, to mm -hmm work as a project manager for oh. our domestic water replacement project, which is a pretty big project for us. So instead of using our own project manager, since they're so overworked right now, right? 
I'm using a project manager from, from one of our engineering companies. For those oh, that's outside the box. I, I love that. I love that. And, and taking some of that load off of your team. Right. For sure. So, uh, Lewis, what are you what are you seeing? Well, I, I mean, I cannot be original here because the reality is people, <laughs> people, people, to be honest. Yeah. And I, yeah. I haven't seen any particular mm -hmm. change. It's just aggravated, you know, yeah. the situation with uh, finding professionals and uh, uh, good facility managers, good uh, building engineers, people now coming back more dedicated to employee experience it is the biggest challenge we have and i mean I, you know I, I was at the board of ifma during covid so we did sure. good mm -hmm. enough to try um, and we did a lot trying to establish fmp cfm mm -hmm. and uh, as as a leading uh, um, certificates and and and, and uh, education track for our professional but still it's kind of a drop in the ocean. We need we need more people, and uh, it's been more difficult. Uh, also, because people are more aware of their own health, and and they are you know retiring earlier, and that's another topic that we 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 have seen in in this year have been uh, so so basically uh, to this audience here. I think there is a great opportunity if you are in this market to continue your career to engage in any of the uh, um, educational tracks that are in the market to get to the next level. And if you can, in that process, bring somebody, welcome, because we need more. We need more professional. By the way, I'm not talking only about US. It is a global problem, OK? Certainly. And whether you are in Europe, Asia, yeah, there's no enough professional to take care of our uh, portfolios across the globe. Mm -hmm. No, I, I can definitely see that. I mean, it's 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 the the recurring theme that we're hearing is with the supply chain, with the people, uh, just trying to find people and keep people. Um, th that's a very big deal. And and Bert, what are you seeing at your sites? I'm much like Deborah, uh, during COVID, people really assessed what their priorities were going to be going forward, and we had a lot of uh, very highly skilled technicians that decided it was time to step away, time to be with their families. And so we've lost a lot of people because of this uh, reprioritization of what's important to them. And I applaud them for doing that. We've also seen uh, the marketplace because of retirements and, and people just not returning. We mm -hmm. saw a lot of our highly uh, skilled technicians and our leaders move to other organizations. The market's, yeah. market's red hot for people uh, that are willing to relocate. Right. And so we've seen people um, move back home to family for more money. We've seen people move across the country for, for executive level jobs. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of movement. So obviously, uh, part of my daily routine is thinking about retention of employees. How do I keep them here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a, a like to Lewis and your point, uh, all of your points, it's it's a global problem. It's it doesn't matter the industry. It doesn't matter who you are or even geographically. Everybody is running into the same thing. I mean, I've heard horror stories to the point where they they've offered a, or extended an offer to somebody who's literally sitting in the chair across from them and uh, they throw the number at the, at the at the person and the person literally says I got I accepted another job last week that actually offered me a five thousand dollar signing bonus I just wanted to see if you paid more and literally got up and left I mean it's a different world today um, I think the the emphasis on people reprioritizing or prioritizing their family and their personal is 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 a big shift and I've heard that as well. And, and I appreciate all of you sharing this because I think it's this is an industry wide thing. Um, and we're all we're all seeing that. So let's start with uh, with Lewis on this one. So how is life at your facilities post COVID? Well, I don't think we are post COVID. That's the first thing on, on this question. So, so I think we sure. need to yeah, we, we are in the COVID era, and, 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 and that yeah. doesn't mean that it's COVID. We are in the pandemic era, so it would be a situation like this, 
um, kind of extraordinary situation. So what I think is, and I mentioned at the beginning, I think the life is more complicated because it's not binary anymore. It's not homework, okay? No. It is multi granular, multi uh, uh, lines, and, and you need to, uh, uh, you have to deal with that uncertainty every day. Uh, on top of that, people are, you know, we're working from home, but so we, we have entered in, 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 in the houses of people. I mean, it's great to see that all of us, I think you are in your house, David, yes? So and, and, and I'm actually in a hotel. <laughs> I live so, in a hotel practically. <laughs> okay. even, even worse, we've entered in the room of the people and, and, and right. our, our life have become, I mean, totally, uh, if you open, open to, to yeah. um, uh, your dogs, your son, your daughter. So, so that's what I, I, mean, I think the awareness of our team. So working with people that before were only, you know, especially teams that are working in the buildings that are every day. Right now, we know more about the people uh, life. Yeah, and we need to be aware of that and manage that in a proper way, especially for leaders. Uh, it's been, um, well, difficult, but on the other time, rewarding because I feel, and Deborah mentioned about uh, productivity on Zoom. I feel that I know more about my people now that I knew before COVID. Uh, before sure. COVID, and and uh, I'm mean, sure that's a trend that will not stop. Um, this is our life right now, and you yeah. know we need to manage with that with uh, on that. So that's the biggest kind of um, flexibility and multilateral knowledge of our workforce. Yeah, certainly, no, certainly, and and I I can I can see the same thing. I I I feel you because. I probably know about my co more about my coworkers than I, I knew in the last three or four years <laughs> over the last year and a half, you know, and good, good or bad, you know, <laughs> but uh, uh, let's go back to Deborah. So Deborah, what are you seeing? So I guess I don't want to underplay the suffering, of course, that many experienced Certainly. during COVID, but on a positive note, I believe COVID has increased again, like I mentioned before, the work-life balance and it has also forced us to improve technologically at a very fast pace. Um, it has made us look at, I guess, creative ways to do business. We're going again outside the box to find different ways to stay connected. I know right. during the pandemic, uh, our team would have 15 to 20 minutes in our staff meetings just to do motivational talks or, mm. or or to talk about what was going on in their lives or something like that. So like Lewis mentioned, we got to know each other a lot, a lot better than we even did before. We actually took intentional time to get to know each other and know more because we weren't in the office bumping into each other at the water cooler or, or having coffee together. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and I, I can definitely see that. Dan, what are, what are you feeling at your sites? Well, we're pretty much back to what I call normal. Uh, we still have some protocols out there that we'll probably continue to maintain. Um, we are maintaining one residence as a quarantine, which we, of course we haven't used, but I think overall our group is a sense of relief because like you said, we were here the whole time. We jumped through hoops to replace signage across campus. We had 190 some buildings, making sure all that was done. We had all the cleaning to do. Um, there was a lot that was happening and, and it, it paid off in the fact that we never did have to use a lot of our COVID quarantine buildings that we had. Mm -hmm. But I can tell that the, the, the workers are happy to be back more normal schedule. Um, I think they realize how flexible we can be now. And like Deborah was saying, you know, we've introduced some new technology to here on cleaning and things that we probably wouldn't have done in the first place that have helped out tremendously with um, keeping the buildings clean. That's great. That's great. And and Bert, what are you seeing? Well, our teams during COVID were under a tremendous amount of stress. Like Dan, getting signage up, keeping the buildings clean, new cleaning protocols. Um, my team was also responsible for setting up community vaccination clinics across mm -hmm. the Houston metropolitan area. So mm -hmm. set it up, tear it down 12 hours later. Um, we were we were the vaccine circus. We could get it up and down very quickly. 
but one of the things I wanted to point out to the audience uh, is kind of a healthcare perspective. One of the things that we have seen uh, coming out of COVID, which is a change across the country, is the rise in behavioral health issues with uh, adolescents, uh, teenagers, et cetera. And we always had some of that prior to COVID, but it is, um, it is off the charts now, and I'm really concerned about that. I have had to uh, train all of my security officers on how to de-escalate behavioral health patients. There's specific training we had to give to all of them. So our life post-COVID, um, we've come back to as normal as we can get, but we are in a new normal dealing with a different group of patients today. I could I can see that you know it it's we we do a lot of work in healthcare and um, it's a different mindset than other other areas that we go to. I'm on site this week at a school district in Northern California, and um, it's it's different from healthcare because we were in healthcare last week, and it's just different. And people don't understand that toll that that I think um, the the mental health side of this is has taken on people my uh, my daughter um she never stepped foot. we moved from from the northwest to florida about two years ago and the first year in the middle of the pandemic and for the first year she never stepped foot in her school and i think that took a toll um that social interaction and and i think to to your point too dan where you were talking about having people come back and and almost wanted to come back no matter what because they missed that social interaction too and i think that was a disconnect for so many people um it's 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 not the same sitting across from somebody seeing them smile as it is in in zoom but but at the same time you know i had a conversation this morning with some folks that said you know they've had a bunch of people that have, have recently caught COVID again you know i was fortunate i i didn't catch it for 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 two years and then i got it and it wasn't great. Um, and I think it's, you know, the it was a reality check that it's still there. And um, I think, you know, to, to Lewis's point, it, we're in that, we're, we're still in the COVID, COVID era. It's not gone. So it's not a necessarily post-COVID. It's it's here and, and it's here for, for the foreseeable future. So I, I really appreciate each of you sharing that. Um, so let's jump to our next question here is, so what is your, what would you consider your biggest win at your facility? So what's the biggest accomplishment or biggest thing that you're proud of at your facilities? So let's start with, uh, let's go ahead and start with Bert. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah. For us, it was finding a way to think differently about the work we do. Mm -hmm. And to that end, we've been able to, uh, we've piloted a dashboard, which we are using to, will use to run the facility. And in that dashboard, it includes alarm management. It allows us to uh, dispatch uh, technicians to work on items. It gives them access to alarm uh, management history. Um, we also, uh, in this uh, new dashboard, we're monitoring power from the uh, Texas grid. As many of you have heard about our world famous ice storm. Um, and <laughs> monitoring uh, power from ERCOT, which is the bulk of the grid in Texas, and then uh, from the Midwest Independent System Operator, which is the other part of Texas where we have another hospital. So just monitoring all of those resources. And before we put all of this together, that information was in a dozen different places. So bringing it all together, kind of like the dash in your car, so we can mm -hmm. see how we're gonna drive this large uh, healthcare system forward uh, has been a huge win for us and really excited about going to the next phase of that. I love that. Yeah, leveraging, I think, technologies today, you know, I I often tell people, you know, this this is 2022. Come on. <laughs> you know, if you're not if you're not leveraging stuff that's available today, come, come on. Uh, so let's jump over to Dan. What are, what are you what are you seeing at your sites as far as your wins? Well, I think to be honest with you, the biggest win we had this year was is um, we're a higher ed, we're a state entity, um, we're classified staff, so we have a pay structure that has a equity across the board. 
um, for different pay grades. Um, we struggled with custodial entry level positions, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, we were losing people, like you said, to, to higher um, higher offers from other companies, um, skilled people leaving. Um, sure. We finally got a, a restructure our pay scale to to bring it back up to almost a market value. So that was a real win for the employees. Um, it, it brought morale up at the right time because, like you said, you know everybody was burnt out from all the changes we had. So. Um, being able to have them revamp the pay scales to to be more equitable to these employees, I think, was a big win. Uh, it's that's really great. That's great. Yeah, that's certainly certainly a win for sure. Win for the employees. Win for the overall morale. I would assume as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Deborah. Interesting because we did the same thing. We restructured oh, our pay scale, which helped a lot, especially as you mentioned. Uh, the lower paying jobs that we had. Um, we also more more um, specific to our department in facilities design and construction, we took the time to create our strategic plan. Since we were having so many uh, Zoom meetings and all of that, we worked together to create and finalize the project management uh, manual so now when we onboard new project managers, we have something that they can have where all the information on how we do everything specifically for our department here at the college uh, is done, where to find the information and so on. But we also took the time to create and transfer everything we did to an electronic format. Mm. We had started that process, but of course we get so bogged down with projects that we put everything in the back burner but because mm -hmm. of COVID, we were forced to move that ahead. And now all of our forms, everything is electronic. Wonderful, wonderful. And Lewis, what are you seeing as far as your, what do you consider your wins? Uh, well, the biggest one, and obviously it's not related to one specific building, but I think the biggest one was the opportunity that we had at the beginning of the year we set up a training program for many of our professionals at the company. Again, international, not only US, but all over. We, we set up various stages of that training. So we started entry level with Essential of FM, all, all related to IFMA, most of them. So we've been able to train more than 90 people in the company during this year. We thought at the beginning that we are, going to, we are not going to be that busy, which that was a big miscalculation, but still <laughs> it's great to, to have uh, I, I think 30 people doing FMP, uh, less people doing CFM, and, and some of them, uh, I think two or three, we did uh, SFP as well. So training our people so they feel value and they get that refresh after coming back. We found that some of them hasn't been in school for six, seven years. I mean, definitely for the last two years, nobody did anything. And it was a great opportunity, by the way, for people working from home to try to learn uh, and th those opportunities were available. So that I think was very rewarding and people, our teams are uh, received that as a very good uh, compliment to those uh, non-monetary compensation, by the way. Um, we are now doubling down on that for next year and uh, scaling that up to, if you did the essential, now you can go to FMP. If you did FMP, you, you three, four years from now, you would be CFM and, and, and some of, uh, senior managers, we are putting them through MCR. So to the wow. folks and people that are listening, I think it's a great opportunity these days to use and reflect and go back to school, myself included. I did, I did, I'm doing now one, one of those right now. So I think that's, I'm, and my team would say that that's a big change and win on, on 2022. Love that. Love that. And hey, Bert, uh, one thing I, I remember when we had spoke at one point, too, um, you had said that uh, Texas Children's had done some things with some different pay and, and stuff uh, for your employees, too, I believe. Yeah, we've we've had a number of programs here. Um, much like Dan, we uh, adjusted our housekeeping uh, base salary um, some time ago. But uh, in addition to that, we had a program called 123 Retention Bonus. And so if, if people stayed uh, past certain dates, they've got 1%, 2%, 3%. Um, so that was, was very significant. Um, 
and all of the employees in the system received a full week of PTO as part of uh, the system saying thank you for working during COVID. So a uh, number of financial incentives and for those staff that are in the entry level positions such as housekeepers, mm-hmm. that's a big deal. That was a lot of a lot of money for them. And so very pleased that we can do that. Well, oh, that's great. That's I, that's great. I love that, you know, I think the emphasis on on the importance of our facility team, of our custodial team has never been, uh, the spotlight has never been brighter than they are today on, on those teams and they should be lifted up. I, I, I love that. Um, so let's go on to our next question here is, tell us about uh, and expand on some of this too with what are some of your key initiatives moving into 2023? And let's go ahead and let's start with Deborah on this one. All right, so I think the biggest initiative for us is creating a sustainability area within our facilities department. Um, Many years ago, we had a sustainability manager. He left, and after he left, um, there was a committee that kind of tried to follow up, but it's not the same having just a committee than to having a facilities group in charge of making sure we have a roadmap, that we have Mm -hmm. a plan. So that's our biggest uh, initiative right now that we're going to be launching uh, come 2023. Love that, love that. So let's go into Dan. What are some of your big initiatives for 2023? I think our biggest initiative is um, reducing energy consumption, energy costs. Um, We've been big on that for the last seven or eight years. We've been converting all of our systems from steam to hot water systems. We've got geothermal, Mm -hmm a large geothermal plant and centralized chill water plants. Um, we were down to 95 kBTU per square feet, which is extremely low. Um, that was the end of this fiscal year. We're gonna try and get down to 90 this year, but increasing costs is gonna probably cut into that a little bit. We've also got a new health science center that we're opening up this year and a um, new computer um, data science building that's being brought online. So. We're going to do those projects, and then we're also um, continuing with more of the autonomous um, cleaning equipment. We've got some new new machines that are out there using. We've tested and done some pilot programs with, so we're going to continue looking at that. Got you. Got you. Okay, great. No, that's that's wonderful. And Lewis, what are you? What are your some of your big initiatives for 2023 for you and your team? Well, keeping keeping on 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 Dan's note, I think savings would be a very important. A topic in 2023. I mean, we we're talking about COVID, but now we have a recession knocking our doors in every single country in the world, and, and no, economies are not growing at the same pace that we were used to uh, at the end of the last decade. So, what I, what we are seeing already is customers uh, uh, talking to us about how can we help them to reduce the the, the total to- cost of occupancy. Energy is one mm-hmm. factor. Uh, but there are others, I mean, service provision, reducing teams. Um, so that, that would be a big, big uh, topic. Um, is already, by the way. The second one I see as a service provider and what I'm seeing in the market is that there would be a, a, a kind of boom in the FM market in 2023. I, I, I can see it already because of these savings and because of the needs for professionalized services. Many companies, including first generation outsourcing, there would be probably a few of them at, at the global level. Same as we saw 2009, 2010, after the crash of 2008, I think that will happen in a more organized way uh, because we, we have learned a lot uh, from, from those years, but I think that that definitely will happen. It's happening already. We have a big pipeline. Uh, all the service providers are busy and at the end of the year. Um, that's that's and definitely. I mean, just to close on the people, because I, I think that would be another another initiative. I need to set up a team, a, a, a more robust team in Europe. I need to recruit people in Asia, and I need to continue for uh, recruiting and 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 fulfilling filling the positions that we have in in the U.S. So so mm-hmm. that all all of that will kind of lead us to a very busy 2023. Certainly. No, and I appreciate you sharing that because I, I agree. Um, Bert, how are you? What are some of the big initiatives with Texas Children's? 
Well, you've heard me talk about my dashboard. We're going to go to phase two implementation of that. We really need to make that work. Um, we've just kicked off our decarbonization roadmap, uh, which is going to be a big initiative over the next 12 months. And That's we couple that with uh, what we call here at Texas Children's system optimization. So trying to wring out every bit of savings we can out of, out of our utility systems, chilled water, uh, electricity, et cetera. We're also looking at, you know, can we use or acquire more renewables in the electricity that we're buying? We're up to about 18%. And so the challenge I have for my team is, can we push that up to 23 or 25%? Uh, that's something we're looking at. And then the other initiative we have going on is really related to retention of employees. We've fundamentally changed the game in how we bring employees on board in our division. And um, once they've been job offered, the leader here must make a phone call to them. They must send them a written offer letter. They must then do a check-in phone call after that offer letter. They must be available when they're onboarding. We have a leadership review where every new employee meets with myself and uh, the other executives and directors in the division. They spend a full 90 minutes with us to tell us who they are, where they're from, what their story is. And then they have another 30-day check-in with us and another 90-day check-in with us because we're wow. working hard to keep them once we get them. Yeah. And so made that investment. So that is a huge initiative for us as well. That's that's amazing. That that's fantastic. And I'm I'm hearing some common themes that, that I love. One is everybody's addressing the issue with retirements and, and that retention and, and then focus on training. I think that's a big deal. Um, I think that goes a, along with, with that retention is if you give them a roadmap, a path to to make more money, to to you know enhance their career, enhance their their work life balance, which which comes with money and any number of different things with flexible schedules and things like that. That's a win. That's not just a win for the employee. That's a win for the org. Um, the other thing is obviously the supply chain. Um, that's universal. I'm hearing this everywhere. And I am going to ask a follow up question here with regards to. To supply chain issues, Dan, you mentioned that that you're stocked up on on some different things. But from the from the group, what are some of the other things that you're doing to address the supply chain challenges? And and Bert, what, what are some of the things that you're running into, and what are some of the things that you've had to shift to address that? I at least in, at the college, we're yeah. trying to purchase the equipment when we're still under design to be honest which we've never yeah. done before <laughs> we kind yeah. of try to uh even do it during pre-construction um that's one thing we're trying to do certainly and uh bert what are you running into what are some of the things that you're able to do or, or some success things that you found as as being able to address that yeah we one of the things we looked at, we looked at all of our offshore purchasing and we moved as much of that spend as we could back into the United States. And mm -hmm. so we uh, implemented contracts for masks, for example, uh, here in the United States and eliminated that spend that we were having com coming out of China. That was a, was a really big deal. Uh, we've expanded our warehouses. We've expanded the amount of inventory we have on hand. Um, we now, in, in many of our areas, we have two to 300 days of inventory on hand um, because of the ongoing hiccups in the supply chain. We want to make sure we can sustain operations. Um, sure. And so a lot of emphasis then is placed on the back end, making sure that uh, we're moving product correctly, ex expiration dates are being paid attention to. Um, but with three warehouses, um, we're in pretty good shape here. That's great. No, that's great. And Lewis, what are you seeing at some of your sites too? Or how are you guys addressing the supply chain issue? Well, I mean, I think it had strengthened our relationship with our partners and vendors, you know? I mean, I mm -hmm. think uh, we, we realize, all of us, that, you know, one-off situations are not uh, suitable anymore. So we need to have a vested interest in our partners to uh, the end result of what we deliver. 
So I think we have created, in order to avoid what happened, okay, we have created a long-term vision, long-term partnership with our suppliers and vendors um, across the globe. So they feel that we are, you know, the, the partner of, cho of, cho of choice uh, mm -hmm. uh, for them. And, and when, when we have uh, a request, they, they attend that, you know, I mean, at least with some priority. And there are, you know, there are uh, situations where it is impossible. I mean, you mentioned a couple of uh, things like chillers or generators and uh, factories are overworked. I mean, uh, that was the word that they were used. And I think everybody is, but especially manufacturing. So I think by approaching those relationship with a long-term vision, uh, long-term uh, gain, I mean, win-win relationships, I mm -hmm. think make, make that um, at least to avoid, you know, long, uh, a huge disruption in, in, um, in, the, in the supply. But also, you know, like, like Bert just mentioned, look, you need to have things in advance. I mean, there's no anymore just in time, you know. Right. You need to be prior to, and and that costs money. That increase the balance sheets uh, of every single company, but that's the only way you would be able to sustain those operations that are, especially in data center, labs, um, healthcare industry that cannot stop. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that, that's what we are doing, and and I hope it will bring more results in the future because we just started yeah. with that, and it's a process. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And Dan, what are some of the other things that you're you're doing? You mentioned that you've you've had to stock up on some things, but what are some of the areas that you're you're able to to consider a win as far as I, I figured out a way to to get stuff when I need stuff? But what, what are some of the things that you that you've had to do to address the supply chain as well? Well, one we, we partnered with Granger. Um, we have a contract, oh. MRO contract with them, and and they actually are a partner in us on our warehouse now. So we were able to leverage through them and their buying power to get a lot of stuff a little bit quicker. Um, the other is, is that, you know, I found that my buyers were reaching out to the actual manufacturers themselves and trying to get a contact there to, to find out how they could track down where something is. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we use certain vendors here. Um, we've had to go outside the box and try to find vendors from other states or other areas to, to try and get stuff in here. Um, you know, the, the big, the big problem we had was, um, like I said, with our building automation, variable frequency drives, they're, mm -hmm. they're out 30 weeks on some of them. Um, we've been able to locate them and get them here within a week or two by just continually searching across the United States, different warehouses, finding them. Um, we also partnered with some of our large construction companies, um, that, that do major construction pro projects here. Um, to see what they had that they may be able to provide us because we have research facilities that we have to keep going. We have the students here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, student housing is extremely important. So um, it's been pretty successful. Um, there's a few times where we've had to, to actually um, redo the system to operate without the component, um, if possible, to keep it up and running. But mm -hmm. um, so far, um, knock on wood, we've been been holding our own. Yeah, I, well, and I think, you know, it with the supply chain issues, it causes a snowball effect. I think a lot of organizations are running equipment to fail, um, especially the older equipment. They they can't find parts. They can't get the new new equipment to replace it. So they're running it to fail. And the, the challenge is, and, and you all know this, the challenge is now you don't know when it's going to fail. You know it's coming. But is it is it six months from now or is it two years from now? Um, I, I'm on on site, like I mentioned, at a school district this week, and and some of their equipment is, you know, it, it's on its last leg, you know. But they're they're actually to address some of the the issues that they're running into of getting the equipment, similar to what you you both said, uh, Deborah and and Dan, with regards to looking at projects, looking at the the different vendors that I'm working with to try to see what they have. And they're rolling that into some of the project budgets to pay for some of those because th th that's the only way they can get it. Um, so it's, it's a challenge. So uh, Jen, let's uh, let's see if we have any questions from the uh, from the audience. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for this interesting discussion and thank you to all attendees for sending in questions. Um, and I encourage everybody, if you still have questions, to submit them via our question box. Okay, to get started, um, Deborah, I think this question is more um, for you. Um, what is the primary focus of the projects you are funding with HERF and how do you overcome the long-term planning and sourcing for large projects? Hmm, good question. <laughs> so, Oh my goodness, we have so many projects um, for her. Some of them that we are doing right now, of course, are the chiller replacements that are to the last days. So we've been wanting to do that for a long time so that we're doing that. That improves the uh, quality of our air systems in our buildings. So that's one. The other one is um, our IT closets for the longest time as well needed to be um, improved. So we're doing that, um, but mainly um, replacing mechanical equipment that needed to be replaced so that our conditioning system uh, continues to be the best that we can provide. Um, the second question was, sorry, if you can repeat it. Oh yes, of course. Um, the second question was, um, how do you overcome the long-term planning and sourcing for such large projects? Okay, so as I mentioned before, what we are now doing is we engage the architect as well as the contractor at the beginning of the project, and they work together during the design process, and that gives us the opportunity to start the procurement process of the equipment that has long lead time um, to be done early on, even before we finish the design on the projects. Great. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we do have another question here. Um, talking about frequency drives, um, where are you getting them from? Um, this person needs to replace some of them. So I think this is open <laughs> to everybody, um, whoever wants to answer. <laughs> we get them. Um, yeah. yeah. Our two primary brands are ABB and Yuskawa. Um, if you want to give them my contact information, I have my purchasing people give them a um, give them a contact the companies that we're dealing with to get them from. Wonderful, wonderful. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, now. Here's another question. How does AV technology play a role in your strategic process and planning? Um, and I think this is, again, open to everybody. You said AV? Jen, sorry. Yes, I said AV. Do you mean audiovisual? I believe so. OK, yeah. OK. Well, well, it's very important. By the way, I mean, we are all in a, in a very uh, a virtual webinar and, and probably there are people uh, 75 there were 80 more than 80, 80 people before so we are all over the place and we are now communicating each other so there's no way the word uh, any workplace including manufacturing by the way will will uh, be able to uh, thrive without AV technology mm -hmm. I mean, in every single room, I'm, I'm today at Salesforce Towers here in San Francisco. So everywhere you have, you feel that you can get connected. There is camera, there are screens, microphones. If you have, and we are having another event with, with their people connecting remotely. That, that hybrid uh, type of event is kind of uh, here to stay forever. I think uh, everybody's trying to, you know, um, explore that. and. I think uh, when we do projects uh, and when we do refurbishment, new new offices, um, that is a big uh, part of uh, the, the plan and increasing meeting rooms and, and those uh, capabilities to be able to work uh, remotely and physically and, 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 and um, uh, uh, digitally. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I believe we have time for one last question. Um, and I believe this would be suitable for anybody who's interested in answering. Do you think facility services outsourcing is now more important in terms of savings for facilities? Speaking mm -hmm. of a 2023 possible recession. 
I can take that. <laughs> I <would say> no. <laughs> I believe in institutional knowledge uh, being extremely important uh, in facilities. And I personally don't agree on outsourcing um, facilities. I mean, I do believe that we can use the help, as, as I'm doing right now, using a project manager uh, for specific projects, but outsourcing in general, I would say no. Well, I need to I need to jump in, obviously, <laughs> Deborah, so, because that's my work. So I tell you, I mean, institutional knowledge is not um, it's not in contradiction with outsourcing. We have had a client for more than 20 years, and obviously, when you have a client with 20 years, you are the repository of that institutional knowledge. But more importantly, and David mentioned something at the beginning, and we we never came back to that about digital transformation. When you have the right tools, the right um, um, uh, database of your uh, portfolio, you can change. I mean, in, in fact, people are going to change over the life of a building. I mean, you have a, a, a building that will last without any major uh, reconstruction, probably up to 50 years, yes? But I mean, you will not have 50 years employees. What you need to have is the data, the, that institutional knowledge in some places where various generation of FAMs will come and work on that. But moreover, I think that the, the ability of the outsourcing companies to develop employees over their career has been proven that uh, except for very, very limited exception, and maybe you, uh, Broward County is one of them. I love your county, by the way, I go there anytime I can, and a lot of <laughs> friends there. But uh, to be honest, we, we're proven that there, that can be, you know, uh, done in a, in a companies that are specialized in in, uh, in facility services in terms of career development. So, but still, both models have a way to subsist. So it's not one is not exclusive of the other. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and and to 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 expand on that as well. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's information is king. Um, who has the information and and accessing information i think at the end of the day is is the key and and just being able to be nimble and flexible so that whether you're using outside vendors or, or they're all in house whichever the case everybody should be, have access to the same stuff and i think that's the disconnect that many orgs have is um you know and, and even bird had mentioned this before that you know he's working on a dashboard program right now that was in multiple places in the past that's every org is like that every org so i think at the end of the day it's a it's just a collaborative approach and and i love that consolidation that that bert's talking about right now um with regards to you know i'm not having to go to 15 places to try to find information to do my job and you know whether that's my vendor is doing the job, my team's doing the job. You know it's that collaborative approach. I think um, is is key. So awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much for the discussion today. It looks like we are out of time. Um, so again, thank you, and special thank you to Arc Facilities for sponsoring this webinar, and of course, thank you to our audience for attending today. Um, a recording of today's session will be made available on our magazine's website, facilityexecutive.com, and um, a follow-up email with the recorded session will be sent out to all registrants from Arc Facilities. Um, thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you all.